Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Assembly Judiciary. Committee Secretary, please take the roll. Assemblywoman Bilber Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Gallant. Here. Assemblyman Gray. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Here. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblywoman Mosca. Here. Assemblywoman Newby. Here. Assemblyman Ortliger. Here. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Here. Assemblyman Yurick. Here. Chair Miller. Here. And with that, Let's see, I would like to welcome everyone here that's here in Carson City, those that will be viewing, I'm not, do we have a room in Las Vegas? Those that would be viewing from Las Vegas and of course online, whether on YouTube or through Nellis. Um, just a few um, tidbits before we get started. Again, asking that everyone make sure they turn down the volume on their devices. Of course, we will have public comment today. We also, um, I'm sorry, you can imagine today there's a lot of messages coming in. Um, we also have, as you know, a hefty work session. So we will, um, excuse me one moment. Okay, so we're back to normal somehow, a little bit. Um, so we w do have a, f a hefty work session today. We also have two bills that we're gonna hear this morning. So we're going to start, we're going to, but we're also having members that are obviously disappearing off the dais to go handle some of their own personal bills and stuff like that. So we're gonna do a little bit of work session, hear some bills, and then do some more work session, okay? You also know how today goes, we will, um, most likely recess and then come back so you can anticipate that judiciary will most likely come back at some point this afternoon as is pretty much the norm for all committees today. So even committees that aren't scheduled today, they may be agendized. So if you've been following stuff in other committees, you might wanna check those as well because with deadline day, there is a high probability that they're agendized as well. And we also have floor today too, if anyone's wondering about that. So with that, we will go ahead and get started with our work session. Okay, I'll go ahead and ask um, Ms. Diane Thornton, our policy analyst, to walk us through the first bill. We're also going to be bouncing around on the agenda, so we will be taking work session items out of order. So the first work session item right now is Senate Bill 14. Thank you, Chair. Diane Thornton for the record LCB. The first bill on work session today is Senate Bill 14, which revises provisions relating to gaming, sponsored by the Senate Committee on Judiciary on behalf of the Nevada Gaming Control Board and heard in committee on May 3rd. There's one proposed amendment from Michael Morton, Office of the Attorney General. He proposed an amendment which amends Section 3 to revert the language back to the original bill amends NRS 463.673 to mirror the new language being proposed in NRS 463.677 regarding the board's enforcement in reaction to technological advances and revises the effective date. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Members, are there any questions about Senate Bill 14? Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Chair. I lost a lot of sleep over this bill, and so I'm just happy to report I can be a yes. Thought I'd start our day with a little humor because it's going to go this way no, the rest not. of the no, day. It's not. No, it's not. Be positive, Assemblywoman. But we appreciate your vote. Any other additional um, questions? Okay, I will entertain a motion for Senate Bill 14. Motion. I have a motion from Vice Chair Marzola, do, and I see a second from Assemblywoman Newby. With that, I will go ahead and assign the floor statement to Assemblywoman Newby. And really, I got caught because I saw Senator Scheibel, and I was like, did I just open the hearing? So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and vote. So all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. With that, it passes unanimously, and I will sign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Newby. 
You're welcome. Ms. Diane Thornton, will you walk us through Senate Bill 39? Senate Bill 39 provides that certain records received, obtained, and compiled by the Board of Indigent Defense Services and the Department of Indigent Services and the Department are confidential under certain circumstances. It's sponsored by the Senate Committee on Judiciary and heard in committee on May 3rd, and there are no amendments to the measure. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much. Members, are there any questions about Senate Bill 39? Not seeing any, I will entertain a motion to, thank you, I have a motion to do pass Senate Bill 39. Mem members, any comments? Okay, I have a second from Assemblyman Gray. With that, all those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? And the motion passes unanimously. I will sign that floor statement to Assemblyman Ordlicker. You're welcome, thank you. Next, we will take Senate Bill 63, Ms. Thornton. Senate Bill 63 revises provisions relating to the Judicial Department of State Government, sponsored by the Senate Committee on Judiciary on behalf of the Nevada Supreme Court and heard in committee on May 3rd. There is one amendment for the measure. John McCormick, Nevada, Nevada Supreme Court, proposed an amendment revising Section 27, Subsection 4, pertaining to the circumstances under which a district court may order a county to provide adequate resources for the court to carry out its constitutional functions. Thank you. Members, are there any questions? Not seeing any, I will entertain a motion to amend and do pass Senate Bill 63. I have a motion from Vice Chair Marzola. I have a second from Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Members, any additional comments on the motion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? The, most, the motion passes unanimously and I will sign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Ms. Thornton, will you walk us through Senate Bill 104? Senate Bill 104 revises provisions relating to traffic offenses sponsored by the Senate Committee on Growth and Infrastructure on behalf of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Judiciary and heard in this committee on May 1st. There is one amendment proposed by <coughs> Senator Wynn and the amendment does the following. First, it amends section 1.7 to provide that the bond that must be posted prior to a hearing is equal to $50 or the amount of the fee, whichever is less. If the court finds that the person committed the civil infraction, the bond is forfeited and a default judgment is entered for any remaining amount. It amends section 1.8 to clarify that a court with jurisdiction over a civil infraction is not required to hold a hearing before reducing a moving violation to a non-moving violation. And it amends NRS 62B.330 to clarify that justice courts and municipal courts have jurisdiction to hear and dispose of violations of law that are punishable as civil infraction regardless of the age of the person alleged to have committed the violation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Members, any questions? Not seeing any, I will entertain a motion to amend and to pass Senate Bill 104. Motion. I have a motion from Vice Chair Marzola and a second from Assemblywoman Mosca. Members, any additional comments on the motion? Not seeing any, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? And the motion passes unanimously. I will go ahead and assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Ms. Thornton, will you walk us through Senate Bill 289? Senate Bill 289 revises provisions relating to crimes against providers of health care, sponsored by Senator Wynn and heard in committee on April 28th. There's one amendment for this measure. Senator Wynn proposed an amendment to include home health care workers in the bill. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, members, any questions on uh, Senate Bill 289? Not seeing any, I will entertain a motion. Motion. I have a motion from, um, to, 
to amend and do pass. I have a motion to amend and do pass by Assemblyman Gray and a second by Vice Chair Marzola. And I will go ahead and assign that um, floor statement to Assemblyman Gray. I am like, this whole democratic process of actually voting. Okay, let me remember that key part. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. The motion passes unanimously, and I will go ahead and assign that floor statement to Assemblyman Gray. Sure. Next on the, um, that will go for the work session will be Senate Bill 378. Ms. Thornton. Senate Bill 378 revises provisions relating to common interest communities sponsored by Senator Ken Rosaro and heard in committee on May 15th. There's one proposed amendment. Senator Ken Rosaro proposed an amendment deleting Section 5, Subsection 8 of the bill, thereby providing that an association may not purchase the unit or hold, lease, mortgage, or convey it. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Members, any questions? Not seeing any, I will entertain a motion on Senate Bill 378 to amend and do pass. Motion. I have a motion by Vice Chair Marzola. Do I have a second? Second by Assemblywoman Hansen. Okay, thank you. With that, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, and the motion passes unanimously. I will go ahead and assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Thornton, uh, take us through Senate Bill 401, please. Senate Bill 401 revises provisions relating to punitive damages sponsored by Senator Flores and heard in committee on April 27th, and there are no amendments to this measure. Thank you. Members, any questions on Senate Bill 401? <clears throat> Not seeing any, I will take in a motion to do pass Senate Bill 401. Motion. I have a motion by Vice Chair Marzola. Do I have a second? I feel like there's a bunch of seconds. I'll take a second from Assemblywoman Mosca. Any additional comments about the motion? Okay, I'll take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, then I will go ahead and that motion passes unanimously. I will go ahead and assign that floor statement. What are you sorry about? Okay, so can we um, let the um, record show that Assemblyman Ordlicker is a no? Are there any other no's? Okay, so with that, the motion passes, and I will go ahead and assign the floor statement to Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. You're welcome. the other page okay all right um miss thornton will you walk us through senate bill 407 senate bill 407 revises provisions relating to personal financial administration sponsored by senator orenshaw and heard in committee on may 5th there's one proposed amendment senator orenshaw proposed revising section 13 the definition of confidential information relating to trust to provide that it includes any other information ordered by the court upon finding that the need for confidentiality outweighs the public interest. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Members, are there any questions on Senate Bill 407? Not seeing any. I will entertain a motion to amend and do pass Senate Bill 407. Motion. I have a motion by Vice Chair Marzola. Do I have a second? Second by Assemblywoman Considine. Any comments about the motion? Okay, not seeing any. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, the motion passes unanimously, and I will go ahead and assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Gallant. You're welcome, thank you. Ms. Thornton, will you walk us through Senate Bill 410, please? Senate Bill 410 revises provisions relating to juvenile justice sponsored by Senator Orenshaw and heard in this committee on April 28th, and there are no amendments to the measure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Members, any questions about Senate Bill 410? Not seeing any, I will entertain a motion to do pass Senate Bill 410. Okay, I have a motion from Assemblyman um, Urich 
and a second from Vice Chair Marzola. Members, are there any comments on the motion? Not seeing any, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Nay. Okay, we have one nay by Assemblywoman Gallant. But I think I would rather assign the floor statement to Assemblyman Urich. <laughs> Were you actually holding your breath? Me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're welcome, thank you. Okay, with that, um, Ms. Thornton, will you take us through Senate Bill 410? 415. Senate Bill 415 revises provisions relating to juvenile probation sponsored by the Senate Committee on Judiciary on behalf of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Judiciary and Herden Committee on May 4th and there's no amendments for the measure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Members, any questions on Senate Bill 415? Not seeing any, I will entertain a motion. I have a motion by Vice Chair Marzola and a second by Assemblyman Gray. Members, any comments on the motion? Okay, let's take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, and the motion passes unanimously to um, do pass Senate Bill 415. With that, I will go ahead and assign the floor statement to Assemblywoman Constantine. You. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, and at this moment, this will conclude our work session for now. Again, um, I can't say that all the um, bills will go out. Um, so many unanimous bills went out and um, passed um, just through in a breeze, but we will return to our work session later on today. So those are, we're gonna stop work session for now. We'll go on to our bills right now, and then um, we will be meeting again later today. So right now we do have two bills up. The first one we are going to hear will be Senate Bill 153. This is sponsored by Senator Scheibel and will be presented by Senator Scheibel and is Ms. Barron co-presenting? Okay. And Ms. Lilith Barron, the policy manager from ACLU Nevada, and I believe... Cy Barnaby from Gender Justice, who is the executive director. And Mr. Andre Wade, is that also happening? Okay. And anyone else, because I see a lot of folks standing up right now. But with that, I'll give you all a few minutes to um, settle in. Senate Bill 153 makes various changes relating to corrections. So please, whenever you are ready, please proceed. Good morning, Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is Melanie Scheibel. I am the State Senator for District 9 and pleased to be in front of you today to present SB 153. Um, SB 153 is not a long bill. It re would require, well, it would put into statute a protection for people who are gender non-conforming, trans or non-binary, who are in the custody of the Nevada Department of Corrections. Um, I have, today you'll hear from the Nevada Department of Corrections in neutral testimony that they already implement um, a policy to ensure that people who are gender non-conforming, non-binary or trans are treated with respect and dignity during their stay at the Nevada Department of Corrections. Uh, this is also required by federal law under the Prison Rape Elimination Act, also known as PREA. The reason that we brought SB 153 came from numerous discussions over the course of, frankly, the last decade regarding the treatment of people who are in the custody of the Department of Corrections, both um, federally across the country and specifically here in Nevada. The purpose of SB 153 is not to impugn any particular person or uh, department or facilities policy, but to ensure that the protections that everybody is entitled to are actually provided for in the Nevada Revised Statute. So what SB 153 does is it requires that the director of the Department of Corrections have or create and pass through their normal process a policy that addresses the particular needs of people who are gender non-conforming, non-binary, or trans who come into the 
Nevada Department of Corrections custody. So what this looks like is having an individualized meeting with each of these people to ensure that they're being housed in an appropriate location, which isn't necessarily obvious. Um, it could be that somebody um, is a trans woman who feels the safest in the men's part of the prison. It could be that they are a trans woman who wants to be housed in the women's department. Um, SB 153 does not require that the Department of Corrections place that person in any particular location, but requires that they have a policy that outlines the factors that they're going to consider when housing anybody in the Nevada Department of Corrections. So if that person is not placed in the location that they request or is not placed in the location that's most appropriate for them, we actually have a set of standards to refer to. So that person can file a complaint or a grievance with the Department of Corrections and not just say, I don't like where I'm housed, but my housing does not comply with the policy. And if, of course, if the housing does comply with the policy, they'll remain in that housing location. The purpose is not to allow people to pick and choose where they go, where they stay, or the treatment that they receive while they're incarcerated at the Department of Corrections, but to ensure that every Everybody has adequate recourse if there is a mistake made during the housing process or while somebody is in the care of the Nevada Department of Corrections. In addition to housing, SB 153 uh, addresses issues including medical care for trans, non-binary, and um, gender non-conforming folks. It also um, addresses their access to commissary and personal hygiene products. Uh, we heard over the interim and well before uh, the 2021 interim from uh, especially from um, trans people or gender non-conforming people who were housed in men's facilities um, but still menstruated who weren't able to access pads and tampons and so uh, the SB 153 requires the Department of Corrections to have a policy in place that allows people access to the commissary and hygiene items that they need um, regardless of where they are housed or in conformity with a policy uh, regarding housing. The purpose is to say that we saw this problem. There were individuals housed in the Department of Corrections who, are not ha who did not have access to hygiene products and everybody should have access to those products. And that shouldn't be determined based on somebody's sexual identity, gender orientation, sorry, gender identity or expression. It should be available for everybody. So SB 153 requires that the Department of Corrections implement a policy that includes access to hygiene items and commissary. It also requires the Department of Corrections to implement cultural competency training. That means that everybody who works in the prison setting has to go through some level of training to understand how to, um, how to treat people who are gender non-conforming and non-binary with respect and dignity. Frankly, it's not something that we should have to be um, training people how to do, but also I think that we can all acknowledge that we learn as, as we grow, as we live, as we develop. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll try to make this as you know clear and as, um, as frank as possible. You know, I've gone through Gender Justice's Trans 101 training, and Cy Burnaby, the Executive Director of Gender Justice, is here, and they can talk a little bit about what that training is like. But it includes things like what is the common terminology or what is the current terminology that the trans community uses to talk about themselves? What are issues that face the trans community? What are ways that we can interact with people who are trans that are respectful and allow us to learn more without putting them on the spot, without making people uncomfortable, without um, without questioning people's identities. Um, for people, different people will have different responses to training like Trans 101. You know, I don't think it's any mystery here that I consider myself an ally to the trans community and that's why I go to the trainings. Some people won't come to it from that perspective, but that doesn't mean that the training is not valuable. To understand who the trans community is, the issues that they face, why they want to be treated with respect and dignity, and how we can best accomplish that. And so what SB 153 does is it requires that every person who works in the Nevada Department of Corrections undergo some form of training. The bill is not especially prescriptive. It just says that everybody has to undergo some form of training to be exposed to communities that they may not have been familiar with before, to learn how to talk about them respectfully, to open up their minds to be cognizant of some of the special issues, concerns, challenges that they might face in a prison setting, and to be able to respond to those. And um, 
SB 153 would codify what the Nevada Department of Corrections is already doing and ensure that for decades to come, any person who's incarcerated in the Nevada Department of Corrections is protected not just by a policy but by a law that says that we treat everybody with dignity and respect in the state of Nevada, whether you are living in Elko or Pahrump or Las Vegas or housed in one of the Nevada Department of Corrections facilities. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my co-presenters. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. I'm very short today. I'm not used to this. My name is Lilith Barron. I'm with the ACLU of Nevada, L-I-L-I-T-H-B-A-R-A-N. Um, in the interest of time, because I know we all are very eager to see the results of the rest of the work session and the other um, wonderful pieces of legislation you have before you, um, I would just like to um, expand upon some of the issues that we are trying to avoid here. Um, in the last presentation, there were some concerns about uh, rape within the facility when it occurs uh, that someone who is transgender is housed in a facility that may not otherwise be something that one might uh, associate with where they are supposed to be housed. Um, and it is interesting um, and also very concerning, but important to understand that transgender people are nearly 10 times more likely to be sexually assaulted in prison um, than other individuals and not the other way around. So I would love it if we could just set the bar there so we don't have to go on uh, off on a tangent about if a transgender person assaults um, another individual in the prison because right now that is not the case. This is in fact the opposite. Um, so nearly one in six transgender people, which is 16%, um, have been incarcerated at some point in their lives uh, compared to 2.7% of the general population. Um, transgender people of color specifically are particularly vulnerable to incarceration. Um, with black transgender folks being three times more likely to be incarcerated um, than white. And uh, they're also more likely to be placed in solitary confinement, which is an incredibly dangerous practice, which leads to suicidal um, ideations as well as completion of uh, suicide. What we are trying to do here is make sure that we instill a policy to protect everyone, including um, those who are incarcerated, as well as those who are working in the facility. We want to make sure that everyone has evidence-based training to be able to handle all of the inmates with dignity and respect. Um, no one is uh, being directed to do anything out of the ordinary here. Um, and also most of the things that, uh, that folks are worried about as far as it uh, applies to rape or sexual assault is already covered under the federal PREA standard. So we are not um, going above and beyond here. We are just trying to make a policy that is uh, compatible with PREA standards with federal regulations, as well as allowing transgender um, individuals who are incarcerated to be more safe when they are in custody. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Oh, I'm sorry. With that, we'll turn it over to Cy Barnaby down in Vegas. Cy, we can't hear you. Yeah, good morning. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Thank you. Let me turn down my speaker. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Senator Scheibel. My name is Cy Burnaby. I am here today to speak about my trans and non-binary community and what can be done to ensure that we are safe and treated humanely and with dignity while incarcerated. If any prisoner endures unnecessary violence, whether inadvertently or purposely, it innately affects their ability to establish healthy lives and break the cycle of incarceration when they return to their communities. Helping to protect trans people from harm in prison gives them a better chance to thrive when they leave the system, and that is truly an investment in public safety. This Senate bill seeks to do that. But I wanna speak on a very important part of this bill, something that Senator Scheibel alluded to before, a piece that ensures a required facility training program for correctional staff, which will include cultural competency training for interacting with these incarcerated persons. And yes, 
I know that a lot of these trainings currently exist within these systems, but I wanna speak on them. I am an educator and I think I'm a pretty good teacher. I've been doing, I've been teaching for over 20 years now. And one of the cornerstones of teaching is a, effective cultural competency is that the curriculum be designed by and delivered by someone in that cultural community. It's possible and it's possible and I'm glad to see that if it could be happening, but I think there can always be an increased awareness and participation of trans people when we are teaching on these issues. Uh, when I teach any staff, any community member or employee, the culture of their workspace changes. There is more compassion, there is less, less toxicity and violence. There's a deeper understanding that we are all in this space together. When we are talking about a prison setting, one of the biggest goals is to have an environment free of violence. And that occurs when we better understand each other. We need to keep prisoners safe and we also need to keep guards and staff safe. We can do that with effective education. I am hoping that in this bill, we are looking at all aspects to ensure a safe environment because in the end, that's what we want for every single prisoner, gay, straight, transgender, cis. If we knew, and we do know this because of real heartbreaking testimony from dozens of prisoners and from alarming rates of credible accounts of violence that are reported every single year. And keep in mind, most incidences are not reported in prison for fear of retribution. Taking a stand with this bill ensures better outcomes for every single person. Doing otherwise would allow for the continual catastrophic harm to a population who has the same amendment rights as any other prisoner. Whether we agree morally with who they are or not, they are human beings. Many trans people are literally broken in prison. I talked with one ex-inmate recently and she shared how even after a childhood of immense and irreversible abuse at the hands of her alcoholic father, and years of abuse and torture by a partner, that it was prison where she knew she would die at the hands of a hateful person. It was there she would be subjected to endless torture in front of other inmates with an utter lack for her humanity. Jen Love Project is a recently released prisoner who now advocates for trans prisoners. And she recently said, there are so many women like me and somebody has to let them know that they are loved and that they are human beings. There's absolutely no data that shows that trans women or any trans person, including trans men, are inherent dangers to other people in prison. There are very few incidences of this happening and a trans person and hurting another person being placed in a women's prison, when that does happen, are outliers. For the most part, like any other prisoners, they, do, they just wanna do their time and live within the prison without unnecessary violence. Today, you can help ensure that they are safe. You can look at the hundreds of incidences and assault and rape and torture of trans prisoners and do something about it. And with that, I ask you to please, for the humanity of others, support Senate Bill 153. Thank you. And thank you, Senator Scheibel. Uh, good morning, Chair Miller, Vice Chair Marzola, and members of the committee. My name is Andre Wade, and I'm the State Director for Civil State Equality, a Nevada statewide LGBTQ plus civil rights organization here in Nevada. So people who identify as transgender have a difficult time navigating their lives, everyday lived lives in society. This is evidenced by high rates of unemployment, difficulty accessing housing, being un unable to access life-saving, gender-affirming health care, and the high rates of violence attacks inflicted upon them. And as you can imagine, if someone who is a transgender is incarcerated, they continue to face challenges by being denied gender affirming health care, by being victims of violence and harassment, more so than other incarcerated persons by both other inmates and at times prison staff and more. To address some of these issues, the Federal Prison Rape Elimination Act, or PREA, was enacted a decade ago. However, PREA is just the starting point for most state policies on trans care and rights because unfortunately issues still exist, which is illustrated by the results of the 2015 United States Transgender Survey of nearly 28,000 trans folks with respondents from all 50 states. The survey found that nearly 30% of respondents were incarcerated were physically and or sexually assaulted by facility staff and or another incarcerated person. More than 37% of respondents were taking hormones before the incarceration um, and then prevented from taking hormones while incarcerated. 
Here in Nevada, the goal of SB 153 is to have the Nevada Department of Corrections, with the approval of the Board of State Prison Commissioners, to establish regulations governing the custody and care of incarcerated transgender persons to further address these concerns. State law, in addition to federal PREA law, is needed because the success of PREA, the Department of Justice notes, is dependent on effective agency and facility leadership and the development of an agency culture that prioritizes efforts to combat sexual abuse and the treatment of transgender incarcerated persons. In order for the Nevada Department of Corrections to enhance their policies and practices, the training of staff will be necessary. This training will, will build upon the training that correction staff already receives to support the the non-discriminatory treatment of transgender incarcerated persons. In our world, people are still learning what it means to be transgender and how to treat them with dignity and respect and what's required under the law. So therefore, the training will also help protect staff and prison officials by allowing them to have a better understanding of the developed standards of care to address unique issues and circumstances that may arise. Codifying these standards into state law will help to improve the incarceral system in Nevada for transgender incarcerated persons and the staff and prison officials who are responsible for their treatment under the law. Thank you, and that it concludes my portion of the presentation. Thank you, Chair Miller. I just want to add one thing that uh, came up in the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing that I don't think we've touched on yet, which is that while this policy does mirror PREA and it applies to people who are in the custody of the Nevada Department of Corrections, it's our intent with this bill to also change the culture at the Department of Corrections. Uh, they have a severe staffing shortage right now. and. Um, in an environment where trans people are not treated with respect and dignity, where nobody understands um, what it means to be trans, where people aren't willing to have an open mind in a conversation, it makes it far less likely that not just members of the trans community, but any members of the LGBTQ community will feel welcome in that environment and want to work there. So part of the purpose of SB 153 is to help the De Nevada Department of Corrections continue on the path that they're on to change their culture, to become more accepting and more open and more diverse so that we can bring more people into the Nevada Department of Corrections to fill all of those open spaces who feel comfortable, who feel safe, who feel affirmed working as guards and secretaries and lests and analysts and all kinds of other positions at the Nevada Department of Corrections that we s desperately need to fill. So uh, with that, I, we are open for any questions. Thank you so much, Senator. We do have a few. The first one is from Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I was uh, kind of struck by what uh, Ms. Barron said about uh, solitary confinement. Can you go into that more? Is that, is that a protective measure, or is that, how, how is that happening? Lilith Barron, for the record. Um, yes, so solitary confinement is often a practice that's used um, as a result um, of staff feeling as if that is the only way to protect a transgender individual or a non-binary intersex individual in within the system. Um, oftentimes these people are preyed on and violent acts are, are occurring um, on their persons. And so uh, the response is to put them in solitary confinement away from harm, however, Studies have also shown how incredibly dangerous solitary confinement is. After the first five days, usually someone has already attempted suicide in, um, in solitary confinement. So allowing for the department to have um, the appropriate co uh, cultural competency and training around transgender individuals, um, as Senator Scheibel was saying, that would allow for an environment where um, staff is not allowing these individuals to be harmed in the way that sometimes they are being harmed. Not to say that staff is turning a blind eye, but sometimes it is not as uh, obvious, you know, to them that someone is being picked on. Um, so that is unfortunately what is ha what is happening, what is common practice, is to put these individuals in solitary confinement. So this would hopefully allow for a mechanism um, for them to be, you know, not only protected, but also um, among the general population. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you so much, Senator Scheibel, and your guest uh, for uh, presenting this uh, legislation. Can you talk a little bit more about PREA? I just heard about it like a couple of years ago. I didn't even know it existed. And 
Are we seeing it being uh, standards being applied currently effectively in our prison system? And, and will this strengthen those efforts? Do we have the manpower and the organizations in the community to help address these issues? I would like to know. Thank you. Melanie Scheibel, for the record, great question. Um, and PREA is definitely a complex federal law that I'm not an expert in. Um, I can, but I think I can answer part of your question about kind of how PREA is implemented through a PREA coordinator at every Department of Corrections facility. Um, and it is another one of those roles that we are understaffed in. And so, um, there is a ratio that's supposed to exist. And I'm sorry, I don't know it off the top of my head. I think it's maybe one coordinator for every 300 or 400 um, offenders. And where offenders is the word that we use in statute for people who are incarcerated at the Department of Corrections. Um, and I think that ours is somewhere closer to one for every 1,000 people who are incarcerated. And it, the Department of Corrections is here, so hopefully they will correct me on that, um, but the point being that the, the ratio is way higher than it's supposed to be, and so that makes it much harder for PREA coordinators to do their job. And the job of a PREA coordinator is to assess every individual's um, presence or an offender's presence in the facility and how they are, how the facility is complying with the requirements to prevent that person from being assaulted or from being a victim of violence. And so that can include things like where they are housed, having access to resources, having access to a grievance process if they are being, um, you know, if, if they are being assaulted or victimized. And so there's supposed to be a PREA coordinator who has a certain number of offenders assigned to them. And right now our PREA coordinator has way too many offenders assigned to them to be able to effectively manage all of them. Um, I, I do know some of our PREA coordinators. There are PREA coordinators both inside the Department of Corrections and also at advocacy organizations outside of the Department of Corrections, um, including the, I forget the name of what used to be the Rape Crisis Center in Southern Nevada. And so sometimes those individuals on the inside and the outside or when I say inside, I mean the Department of Corrections staff and the outside staff will talk to each other to get resources to people like, you know, trauma counselors or medical resources. If the, again, the Department of Corrections has a humongous uh, medical provider shortage. And so if somebody needs medical care related to an assault that the department's not able to provide, they might have to court coordinate. That's why they're called pre coordinators with an outside agency to bring in, for example, a sane nurse, a sexual assault nurse's examination, nurse. Um, and so to answer your question, yes. We hope that this will help to um, increase our ability to comply with PREA and to um, expand the, the pool of people who are willing to engage on this issue because it will hopefully create a more open and accepting and, um, and diverse environment so that we can continue to work towards being 100% compliant with PREA and relieve those, you know, amazing people who who go to work at the Department of Corrections every day and do their best to, to make it a, a safe place to be um, so that we can help relieve some of the pressure. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for bringing this policy and for being here to answer our questions. So you mentioned that this, that there is currently a policy and that we're just codifying a policy and we're not really actually changing anything. So I just want to confirm that. And then I also would just like to know what is the current policy for these individuals? Melanie Scheibel, for the record, um, the current policy is not in writing. And so um, this codifies the current practice and I, and this would require the Department of Corrections to put the policy into writing. Where their current policy is, and again, I hope the department will correct me if I'm wrong, is to have an individualized assessment as required by PREA. And then um, they take a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and so kind of the examples that I gave in my opening remarks were realistic. Sometimes someone says, I want to be housed here, and they get housed there. Sometimes they want to be housed in one location, but the totality of circumstances <clears throat> makes that um, impractical or unsafe, and the department will say no. 
The issue is that we don't have a policy to refer to if that person wants to file a grievance and basically appeal that decision to say this is not in compliance with the policy. And so um, I hope that answers your question. But I can expand or clarify. Um, I don't think we need to do that. I, th I think what, um, and what I, what I appreciate about that is that often we see there are really actually is good things happening in Nevada, right? And sometimes with it out, without it being codified, what happens is it may just be happening now because of existing leadership. And leadership changes, right? Um, uh, sentiments change. And so we don't want that to be subject or contingent upon just who's there in, in, um, in the situation. So that's why I appreciate the request to codify it, to make sure that that ensures that it continues regardless of um, who may be in leadership. Thank you for that. With that, our next question will come from Assemblyman Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Aside from everything else, I mean, we know we've got a staffing problem in the in the, uh, the prisons, and you know we've got you know ratios that aren't safe for inmates or uh, or the uh, personnel. How many hours of training do you think this will take? That'll you know for these officers and uh, take them away from their primary job of actually supervision of the inmates. Melanie Scheibel, for the record, this is currently included in their training. This will ensure that as training modules change and syllabi are updated, that there will always be a portion on cultural competency. Thank you, Senator. Uh, quick follow-on, please. Sure. Okay. Um, a little bit different uh, follow-on. I just wanted to clarify something you said. So there's a policy that's not in writing. Um, I am not quite sure how it can be a policy if it's not right. I mean, the policy is something you're supposed to be able to hold people accountable to. So I'm just wondering uh, what they're actually held accountable to if, uh, if it's not in writing. Melanie Scheibel, for the record, thank you for elucidating the problem. The problem is that there's not a written policy for them to be held accountable to. And so, um, you know, I have a policy of, you know, being honest with all of you when you come into my office. It's not anywhere in writing, but it's a policy that I have. Um, I have a policy of starting ju Senate Judiciary at 1 p.m. on the dot. It's not in writing, but it's a policy that I have. The Department of Corrections has a policy of treating trans and non-binary and gender non-conforming folks with dignity and respect. They have a policy of making an individualized assessment when they come into the facility, but it's nowhere in writing. And so um, the Department of Corrections has many policies in writing, and actually they used to have one. And there is a long political history regarding changes in leadership at the Department of Corrections that could um, explain why that policy was rescinded and hasn't been replaced. And so this bill would require that a policy always be in place in writing. Thank you for that. And, and by requiring a policy in place, we're not codifying the actual prescription. It's just ensuring that there is a policy. And, and so with that out being in the NRS, that would mean that policies can be, change and evolve. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for your question, Assemblyman Gray. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for bringing this bill. Um, earlier in this session in this committee, we heard about um, just the lack of preventative care, uh, particularly for women, pelvic exams, uh, mammograms, and such. And in your testimony, you mentioned that uh, in some cases, uh, the hormonal um, medications are received, and in some cases they aren't. I was wondering if you could elaborate on uh, on that, because it sounds like for some people it's happening, but not for all. And I'm just wondering why, how that goes. Lilith Brown, for the record. Um, right now, um, as Senator mentioned, there are you know, individuals who do not receive the menstrual products that they need because of the placement in their, uh, the placement of um, them in the facility. Um, however, hopefully this in tandem with some other, with the other bill that you did hear about um, would remedy that situation. However, um, again, with, with this in place, it would allow for, 
you know, I'm sure that Director Zorinda is allowing for these individuals to get the products and care that they need. However, if something, heaven forbid, happened to him and he is, you know, someone else comes in, they might not have the same compassion or same, you know, practice um, as Director Zorinda has. So again, that um, right now, I don't think that that is the biggest issue. However, um, if you know, if Director Zorinda were not here to be someone that we could inform, you know, this is not, this person is not getting the care they need. He's like on it right away, right? Like he's literally right on it. And then we've had that already happen during session. You know, the, that person you talked about that wasn't able to get a visit, they're getting a visit tomorrow. <laughs> like he is just, the deliverables are amazing from Director Zorinda. So what we'd hope to see is that uh, this policy could guide the next uh, department director as well to make sure that these individuals are getting the care and the, the products that they need. Sure, proceed. Thank you for that. I was I was also though interested in hormone blockers and like the medications that might be necessary and and whether or not those are being um, adequately and evenly supplied. Uh, to the incarcerated individuals. Lilith Barron, for the record, um, it should be that if the, the individual is already on a medication, whatever it may be before they enter the facility, that they are still given that uh, medication once they're incarcerated. Um, whether or not that is happening at every single facility, I would not be able to speak to. Um, however, I do know um, a friend of mine who was uh, recently incarcerated in a, in a jail was denied some of their hormone um, hormone therapy and we did have to get involved. So that's kind of like where the ACLU would come in, right? Is where if that person is being denied their kind of um, gender affirming care. However, the, the policy and practice should be that if you're on a medication, no matter what it is, that that medication is what is given to you once you are incarcerated. Thank you. We have another question from Assemblyman Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a uh, real quick, easy question. You may or may not be able to answer this. I wish Director Zorinder were here, but how many trans folks are we actually talking about in our prison system? Melanie Scheibel, for the record, my understanding right now is that it is less than 20. And, and of course, those are people who self-identify. There could be other trans folks, and there probably are other trans folks in custody who have not self-identified. All right, thank you. Not seeing any additional questions, I will go ahead and open it up for testimony. So let's start here in Carson City. Anyone wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 153? Good morning, Chair, members of the committee, Erica Roth, E-R-I-C-A-R-O-T-H, on behalf of the Washoe County Public Defender's Office, testifying in support this morning. I think at the end of the day, this bill is very simple. It's just saying let's put some policies in place to ensure that the people who are in NDOC and are going to be in NDOC are kept safe. And so we urge your support. Thank you. John Peel, for the record, from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. We are in strong support of this bill. We'd like to thank the chair for bringing this forward and, and for moving the issue forward for all of us. I think it's important for all of us to continue to educate ourselves as things move forward on how the world is changing and what's happening so that we treat people with dignity and respect, especially when we're keeping him in custody. Uh, thank you. Good morning, my name is Jody Hocking, J-O-D-I-H-O-C-K-I-N-G. And I'm here um, on behalf of Return Strong. We are in support of SB 153 and would just like to reiterate that I didn't bring a million people to read statements from the people that we interviewed <laughs> um, in honor of deadline day. But um, over the past few months, I've actually, because of this bill, have been able to um, talk and interview and interact with people who are in NDOC that do identify as trans um, and their stories of really like how difficult it is and like people refusing to acknowledge pronouns or name changes or any of those things. They're all very widespread problems and so 
think that um, we just love this bill and are in full support of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else here in Carson City wishing to testify? We do not have Las Vegas today, so broadcasting, please open the lines. To testify in support of Senate Bill 153, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chair Miller and committee. My name is Jayla Gibson, G-A-E-L-A-G-I-B-S-O-N, and I'm representing Planned Parenthood Marmonte. We support this bill and ditto other supportive testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Cody Hoskins, C-O-D-Y-H-O-S-K-I-N-S, Political Director for SDIU Local 1107. Uh, SDIU supports SB 153. Um, heard many of the same things we said from other supporters um, earlier. Um, we think these, uh, these policies and the cultural competency um, and the competency trainings here are super important, um, and we support and we urge your support. Thanks. Good morning, Chair Miller, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Serena Evans, S-E-R-E-N-A-E-V-A-N-S, and I'm the policy director for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. As the presenter stated earlier, um, you know, trans individuals are often targeted for horrendous acts of violence and sexual assault, um, especially in an incarceration setting. And so as an organization rooted in ending violence for all individuals, regardless if they are incarcerated or not, we are in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and the committee. My name is Shelby Swartz, and I am from Battleborn Progress. We are here today in strong support of Senate Bill 153 and the betterment of the treatment of our trans family who are currently incarcerated. For far too long and far too often, transgender, gender nonconforming, and gender nonbinary and intersex incarcerated persons have been treated with a flagrant lack of care for their well being while in the custody of the Nevada Department of Corrections. The NDOC often denies incarcerated, gender nonconforming people their right to medically necessary treatments for gender dysphoria. This is unbelievably cruel, and we support this bill to end the inhumane treatment of trans incarcerated people while imprisoned and bring dignity to those folks who have long been denied it. These are human beings treated horrifically while in NDOC custody, and this bill brought by Chair Scheibel will reduce the sexual victimization and other harm that these incarcerated people experience. I also want to talk brass tacks on this. It is a huge risk for our state to not have standards on this issue for our incarcerated folks. If we want to talk about liability for NDOC, we need to have rules and consistencies. We always have a policy and all of our prisons operate the same way. If we do not get this right, we are putting everyone at risk and we've seen losses on these issues in other states that have been brought. Thank you to Senator Scheibel, Sai, Andre, and Lily, and all of the folks who have worked hard on this critical bill. I urge you all to support this legislation. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Erika Castro, E-R-I-K-A-C-A-S-T-R-O, and I am the Organizing Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada here in support of Senate Bill 153. The Eighth Amendment to the Constitution prohibits cruel and unusual punishment to the Supreme Court has held that ignoring an incarcerated person's medical needs can violate that prohibition. SB 153 ensures that our correction facilities are adequately adequately prepared to care for people who are trans, intersex, or non-binary and incarcerated by providing their officers with the necessary training. This is something that is already required federally and just ensures that Nevada is able to fully enforce this practice. We urge you to support the trans community and say yes to SB 153. Thank you.
Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Brianna Scamilla, for the record, and I'm calling in on behalf of Planned Parenthood Votes Nevada in support of SB 153 because we believe that all transgender people deserve dignity, safety, and access to the medical and mental health care that they need, and that this is especially true in an incarceration setting where there is a loss of freedom and an increased opportunity for violence. We urge your support. Thank you. If you have recently joined and would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 153, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Tanya Brown, T-O-N-J-A, B-R-O-W-N, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. We support this bill. We There are no other callers choosing to testify in support at this time. Thank you so much. Um, I apologize. We're starting to look like a Senate committee up here with so few people. But, you, you know, um, deadline day. Yes, yesterday I ended or the other day my final presentation ended up. There was two senators on the dais as uh, the bills were going. So we're, we're doubling numbers, but we're, you know, getting picked off pretty quickly here. So with that, I will open it up for opposition testimony. So if there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to begin opposition to testimony um, for Senate Bill 153, please come forward. Not seeing any. Uh, broadcasting, will you open the lines, please? To testify in opposition to Senate Bill 153, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you so much. Then I will welcome this bill sponsor back up for any final remarks. Oh, I do want to do neutral, huh? Let's do neutral. So is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in neutral? Good morning, Chair Miller, distinguished committee. Um, for the record, Harold Wickham, W-I-C-K-H-A-M. I am the Deputy Director of Programs for the Nevada Department of Corrections. And with me is my expert on uh, offender management. He is the Offender Management Administrator, Kurt Widmeyer. Um, and while we are testifying in the neutral, we certainly uh, thank uh, Senator Scheibel for bringing the bill forward. And we would like to uh, concur or agree that uh, we are already doing all of this stuff in accordance with federal statutes, the PREA statutes. Um, that kind of is our policy, uh, is a PREA policy. And we do follow that because we are audited regularly by PREA uh, throughout different, uh, throughout the nation. PREA audits come in, they review that we are in compliance with uh, the PREA standards. Um, frankly, that's what helps us to keep our federal dollars as well. Um, we are conducting uh, PREA training uh, in all of our academies as staff come in. We've been uh, involved with the PREA standards for, frankly, the last 10 years. Um, so we're getting better at it. This just simply codifies what we're already doing. And as the senator eloquently pointed out, uh, as directors change, policies change, this would just simply put it into law uh, of what we are currently doing. And as far as the, the medical concerns, um, if, if an offender comes in uh, already taking hormones, we do continue that hormone therapy treatment, whatever, that, whatever the case is. And it also goes through our medical review board to ensure that uh, we're doing the right things in accordance with PREA policies. And uh, we, uh, further, we have a transgender committee that meets on a regular basis to discuss individual case plans for offenders wishing to identify with a specific transgender or whatever their case may be. And uh, Kurt would like to add. Thank you, Chair Miller. And, and again, to Senator Scheibel, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Uh, to Summer, uh, Assemblywoman Summer Armstrong's question, if, if I could add a little bit related to PREA. Uh, there's an audit process that happens um, every three years. Every one of our facilities has to be audited. Uh, these auditors are US certified, uh, US DOJ certified auditors. 
I happen to be for the last nine years one of those auditors. The auditors that come to us are not from the Department of Corrections and they are not in any way affiliated with the state of Nevada. So they come from us from other states uh, on behalf of the Department of Justice. There are 43 primary standards and some 250 subordinate standards that encompass everything you see in this bill. Uh, to the point and to echo the Senator's um, statement related to we're already doing these things, I think that's also reinforced with our fiscal note of zero dollars. Um, we don't see any impact related to the implementation of this bill. I think it's important to understand for the committee that um, to say that PREA is a very complex law uh, is uh, that's a far understatement, <laughs> if I may. There are three groups of standards. You have a juvenile standard that applies strictly to the juvenile youth in the juvenile systems. You have adult prison and jails, and then you have community confinement standards. The prison and jails is primarily what we are held to the standard. Um, with that, um, in that audit process, there are policy review, there are interviews conducted with on-site inspection of the facility, uh, interviews conducted with staff and offenders. Uh, for instance, a facility high desert size of uh, approximately 3,500 inmates, there would be um, at least 150 offenders interviewed from various demographics specifically outlined in the audit process. Um, that would also include members of the LBGTQ uh, plus uh, community as well as required by the standards. So it's, it's important to understand that when PREA came on board in good federal government way, it was unfunded. And so the department has scrambled over the last 10 years using the grace of committees like yourself and others uh, to grab whatever dollars we can. The PREA compliance or the PREA coordinators. Uh, at the adult level, uh, it's one per facility, uh, regardless of facility size. That can be obviously very challenging um, the juvenile has absolutely a ratio that breaks it down, which is another complication for the juvenile system as well. Um, and so with our efforts during that audit process, um, if there are any deficiencies identified, um, we have 120 days to correct those deficiencies. This is a plan that is coordinated with the, the auditor and the department. We have to show proof of implementation and corrective action to receive a 100% compliance audit by the end. In the 10 years we've been audited, we've had 100% compliance. Why that's important to us, number one, nobody incarcerated or anywhere else deserves to be a victim of sexual assault, sexual abuse. That's priority one for the department. Number two, failure to comply with the standards is a 5% loss of federal funding, not to the department, but to the the Office of the Justice, uh, Criminal Justice Assistance, which ministers grants to several other agencies and community partners to include victims of crime. So the department is diligent in ensuring that we are never the cause of a 5% loss of federal dollars to this state to ensure we're compliance. We welcome the bill. We absolutely uh, believe in the fact that codifying into state law has no impact to us. Uh, and um, thank you for the time to, to help explain some of this process a little more detailed because it is a very complicated process for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you wouldn't mind, we do have two quick questions for you on procedure and administrative. The first question will come from Assemblywoman Gallant. Thank you, Chair. So if I heard this correctly, uh, it sounds like you guys are already doing it. The motivation is federal funds and the audit. And so... I think there was some concern in terms of like a director could change and then this policy would change, but it sounds to me that it doesn't matter who the director is, you guys are always going to be implementing that. Is that correct? Unless the federal standards change, we would be held to that standard, yes, ma'am. Our next question is from Assemblyman Urich. Thank you, Chair, for the indulgence. Um, real quick question, because it sounds like, again, you guys have done a great job, especially under Director Zarenda, of ensuring safety for all of uh, our, our inmates. My question is, if, especially with the audits and stuff, is there a reason that you have not already implemented a written policy on these issues? Because I hear that it's kind of just this almost a philosophy and a cultural thing, and you're following these standards, but what about, why have you not already written a policy? So as part of the audit process, there are policies that are established. There are, uh, and these are written policies that are established. They, they get reviewed. I, I believe what, uh, to clarify, um, 
there is always an evolution related to the audit process. As national trends change, even though the bedrock of the federal standards is there, opinions comes from the DOJ as to fill into when we deal with the gray. And so we have, we are continually, during those audit processes, if we are found to be deficient in an area because we haven't modified our policy to keep up, um, we go into that corrective action period of that 120 days. Um, the department is diligent in making sure that we make those corrections and make those adjustments uh, as we need to, because at the end of the day, to the state, we owe it to be 100% compliant. So there are bedrock policies that are in written, but there's, there's constant evolution of those policies. Uh, again, uh, I believe the, the language of the law or the bill um, just codifies in a state law that it, the, nece the necessity to continue to evolve our policies with the, the tides and the, the, the trends of the nation. So, so then in other words, because I know we had a bill like this on, it, out of a completely different committee and a completely different subject this session, and I know when I asked about it, one of the first responses I received was, this is to keep us in compliance with federal regulation. <laughs> So therefore, I think that may be really also what we're getting at when it comes to policy, but we're still doing it, but it won't change, it will change. But you're saying based on the audits, this will actually keep us in compliance. Uh, yes, yes, uh, Chair. Thank you so much. For the record, if I may elaborate. Uh, um, and can you state your name um, uh, and spell it for the record? Harold Wickham, W-I-C-K-H-A-M. Uh, just if I can elaborate, all of our policies encompass PREA. When PREA became federal mandates for us, uh, we didn't create one PREA policy, we incorporated PREA into every policy. So all of our policies relate to PREA in some way, shape, or form because it had to be added to the policies to make them correct so that we could pass the federal audits. Okay, thank you. With that, and thank you so much for your willingness to answer questions as well. Is there anyone else wishing to testify in neutral here in Carson City? Not seeing anyone. Broadcasting, will you open the lines, please? To testify in neutral to Senate Bill 153, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you. Then I will welcome um, Senator Scheibel back up for any final remarks. Thank you so much, Chair Miller, and thank you everybody for your participation and engagement today. Um, I think and hope that the rules have been suspended so we can have a work session today, and um, I hope I earned all of your support. Thank you so much. Um, it would be a bit awkward if they hadn't and we were doing a hearing. So I, I will announce that, yes, uh, Speaker Yeager has given us the permission to suspend the rules, and, and the rules that the Senator's referring to is in the Assembly, we have a 24-hour rule which is that we do not work session bills without 24 hours. Um, so they have been suspended. However, um, in order to give members time to, I know they've read the bill, but you know, it, to digest the um, hearing and process and ask questions and even have the opportunity to approach you if they have any questions, um, we will not be work, session it, work sessioning it this morning, but it will be on work session. All right, well, I remain available for any questions. Thank you so much. Um, I, th I think I'd like to make a final comment about um, th this, this bill. Years ago when I was the director of a prisoner reentry re program, one of the um, first questions I asked was, especially with the jails, thinking about individuals, I asked the question, I said, well, what if someone is trans and what if someone, you know, in, in different levels of, um, we didn't use, the, we didn't have the term gender affirming treatment back then, but just, you know, based on operations and stuff like that, if they were in, in different levels in the process. And I remember being told, because, and the reason I asked was because at the time Michigan was using um, basically blue scrubs for men and pink scrubs for women. Well. What, what do you do? And they had just started to realize they needed to change the process, but they literally said, we match the color based on the parts. And it was literally like one of the most mortifying things I could have heard because it also 
the vulnerability and the risk that it put on those individuals. And I'm just so glad that we've, as a people, moved forward and continue to move forward. So thank you so much for bringing this legislation. And thank you to Department of Corrections who are abiding by PREA. Thank you. With that, I will go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 153. Our next bill hearing today is Senate Bill 351. It is sponsored by Senator Harris, and I believe you have a co-sponsor on Zoom. Senate Bill 351 revises provisions relating to communications with offenders. And with that, Senator, your hearing is open, so please proceed when you are ready. All right. Uh, good morning, Chair Miller and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. Uh, my apologies. I did not bring my posse with me like Chair Scheibel, um, but I did bring uh, Miss Tressa Kenyatta, who will speak a little bit to her personal experience. And just for uh, the committee's information, it was a conversation with Miss Kenyatta uh, along with uh, a few other folks from Return Strong that inspired me to bring this piece of legislation. So I'm so glad that she could uh, join me today in this presentation. I'll just briefly go over what the bill does. I think this is my shortest bill that I have. Um, and the premise here is very simple. Currently under law, if you have a felony, regardless of how old that felony is or how fresh it is, you have to jump through some additional hoops in order to be able to visit someone in prison. This bill says no more. Uh, if you have a felony, you still must apply, of course, for visitation rights, but just like everyone else has to apply and it doesn't say that that you can't be denied um, it doesn't say that uh, it, really you're going to be guaranteed to get in especially if you're likely to cause some mischief right but it does say you have a right to visit unless there's some determination or some extenuating circumstances that would justify you not being able to visit. And if there is some reason, they've got to let you know so that maybe you can re dispute that or you can appeal, right? Um, and then we added one additional piece, and that's for folks, regardless of your status, felon or not, if you are seeking visitation and you're denied, they got to give you a reason why so that you have some idea of what the issue is. Uh, with that, that's the whole bill. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Kenyatta to speak a little bit about um, her experience and what, what this bill would do for her. Ms. Kenyatta. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Tressa Kenyatta, K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A. -T -T -A. I have a son that is incarcerated in um, Nevada Department of Corrections. I have been denied uh, several times and uh, this recent uh, application I put in, I was denied and I was required to go and get um, for a possession of marijuana charge that was from 2008. I have not been seeing my son. He went in when he was 18 and he is now 34 years old. Um, this time I have followed through a little bit better with keeping track of, of everything. Um, this last application was denied, but I have here and I have submitted all of the documents that they requested to appeal that denial. Um, right now, um, I'm a community liaison and the behavioral health tech, so I, I did change my life. So I don't feel like I should be penalized in being able to visit my son and to provide him with the support that he needs. I'm the only form of support that he has. Um, I, I work with the community. I've changed my life. I admit that I made mistakes, but of course now um, I do volunteer work in the community. As you know, they have a fentanyl crisis. So I work a lot, of, uh, a lot hand in hand with those clients and organizations that provide them with assistance. 
I just think that uh, this bill is going to provide me with the opportunity. My son has a lengthy sentence. He's been sentenced to 40 years to life with the possibility of parole. Uh, I'm 55 years old. I just don't want this to be our end story that I never get to hug my son. I know that human touch is very important. Um, so I want to uh, just that I have everybody here that can hear and know that uh, me speaking about it has has made me address it because it has caused some uh, anxiety and depression because I have other children. Um, I was able to visit. Um, I have two other sons where one of my sons was in the Arizona Department of Corrections. They, of course, ran my name and saw that I had a possession of marijuana, which was a felony. But because of my, me being his mother and I don't have anything active in the system, I haven't had any contact with the law in, in over a decade. So they immediately approved me. I had a son that was in the federal uh, prison um, and I was approved to go and visit him. Um, all of my sons are out now except for Pierre and they are doing well, they work. Uh, our family went through a lot of struggles at that point when my son first went, but we are all doing good and we all support this SB 351. But all of us are being affected by it because that means that they won't be able to visit either because his brothers have felonies as well. But I just think that with this bill being passed that it will give me the opportunity to be able to to be there to support my son in person and to let him know that it is it is okay and that can only come from a mother. Uh, if you have children, I don't think that you can even imagine not being able to 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 actually hug your child to console them because it's been a rough last 17 years and uh, with the changes that I made in my life, um, I'm a billboard of that people can change. Um, so I support this bill and uh, I'm glad that I've been afforded this opportunity to speak about it and to hopefully make some changes. Um, because I don't think again that someone should be penalized because they have a felony. I made a mistake and I paid for my mistake already. So I don't think that I should be penalized when it comes to going into Nevada Department of uh, Corrections facilities to visit something that belongs to me, really. He's my son still. If somebody, if you have any questions, I'm open for questions. And I thank you for, for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kenyatta, thank you for, so much, for uh, sharing Ms. your Kenyatta story. For, for sharing your story. You're going to want to mute. You're going to want to mute. So um, it's deadline day. I'm going to help y'all out. 2008, it's 2023. 20, uh, that is 15 years, y'all, 15 years of marijuana possession. Um, and that is what's preventing her from seeing her son today. Um, that, that's too long. That's entirely too long. And we know a couple of truths. One. Folks who are incarcerated are likely to have other family members who have been incarcerated, unfortunately. Two, family connection is essential to reducing a chance of recidivism. If you can stay connected to your community, to your family, to your parents, to your children, while you are inside, you are much less likely to return. And so it makes zero sense for us to make it so difficult for families uh, who want to stay connected to their, mem to their family members inside uh, to be able to do so. That's not serving us well. And I think that this bill, um, along with the leadership of, of our NDOC director, will make uh, a very important change. And with that, uh, Chair Miller, I and Ms. Kenyatta are happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you so much. Um, members, any questions? I don't think we have any questions. 
All right. I will be sure to thank Chair Shai before wearing y'all down. I got a question. Quickly, please. I think this is really forward thinking and a great bill. And I've learned a lot this session. And I, if you brought this to me three months ago, I probably would have been like, eh. But it seems like it's on track with the philosophy and the research. And so thanks for bringing it forward. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Dallas Harris, for the record. All right, let's move to testimony. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in support of 351? Thank you, Chair Miller and committee members. My name is Nick Shepak, S-H-E-P-A-C-K. I am the State Deputy Director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center. I also have the wonderful opportunity to sit as the board chair of Return Strong and work with an organization called Social Workers Against Solitary Confinement. In all three of my roles, I've had the um, amazing opportunity to get to know currently form and formerly incarcerated individuals. And there's a saying that felonies are forever. And we see this through housing, we see this through employment. And as a state, I think we're starting to realize that we need to make moves away from this sad fact, that once somebody pays their debt to society, uh, they should be recognized as having completed paying that debt, and they should be able to participate in society like the rest of us. It's been said that family connection is one of the number one things that reduces recidivism and is create successful reentry, and unfortunately, through many decades, we have built systems where we incarcerate entire families, and this bill is a simple step in ensuring that we can keep families together, and that we can reduce recidivism, and we can simply let mothers hug their children. We urge your support. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Jody Hocking, J-O-D-I, H-O-C-K-I-N-G. I'm the executive director of Return Strong. Um, we started to become aware of the situations with families and visitation. And actually, Tressa's family was one of the first families that I met, and they were telling me her story. And I was really flabbergasted. It was confusing to me how somebody could spend decades not being able to see their child for felony possession of marijuana, and I'm not gonna lie, like initially I was like, eh, that doesn't sound right. And then I had to like stop and back away from that and look at the things that I do know about mass incarceration and the racial disparities and the things that happen. And over the past year and a half, we've had family after family after family after family that are predominantly black and brown that are not seeing their, their loved ones, their children. And these are remnants of this battle against mass incarceration that's been going on for decades, right? This is just another rollover of how that happens. Um, I could probably tell you 40 stories off the top of my head, and those are the only people that I know well enough. Um, this work and this bill have begun to have cultural changes with NDOC. They are working with us. They are taking a different approach, and Director Zarenda, Zarenda has been very open about the fact that he believes families deserve and should have contact. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, this bill makes sense. Like, it really, if we believe in second chances, we have to believe in second chances for people to be able to move on with their families also. Um, I would like to say um, during the Senate hearing, there was a woman here, Vivian Jones, and Tressa was actually here also. Um, and since that time, we have been able to, Tressa, NDOC was great about while she was in Nevada that we worked out getting her a behind glass visit with her son. I happened to be at visit the same day, and as I walked in, the like, I'm gonna get choked up, the joy in Pierre's face and in her face. They're like yelling to me through the glass. They didn't get to touch. They didn't get, she didn't get to hug him, but she got to spend time with her son and look in his eyes for the first time in over a decade. Vivian Jones now is getting contact visits with her son. She sits down with him every Sunday and Monday now. This is changing people's lives. I remember one of the first things, this will be my last comment. Okay. 
one of the first things Tressa said to me is, since her son went to prison, her life has never, she's never going to actually be able to live her life because there's always a part of her that is disconnected because she's with him. And until she can get to that point and to understand that this is families all over the state. So thank, thank you. you. So, thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. John Pure from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. Uh, Ms. Jones testified in the Senate committee. Uh, it's probably some of the most powerful testimony I've ever heard, and I wouldn't do it justice by trying to replicate it here. I would say if you have a chance when there's some time, like sit around and wait if you're on the fence on this bill, I would watch that testimony. But there were mothers that talked about not seeing or hugging their son for 20 years. Uh, for, and had been out of trouble, not even so much as a parking ticket for 20 plus years and not being able to see their loved ones. So changing this policy uh, would go a long way in helping people heal. Uh, and we can't always count on Director Zorinda being around. Like one, losing him put us back probably a full decade in corrections. Um, for that four years that we didn't have him. And he's great, and there are great things happening. But we also want to have good policies in place by this body so that it's not dependent on one good person to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify? Broadcasting, will you open the lines for anyone wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 351? To testify in support of Senate Bill 351, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Hello, yes, my name is Cassandra Drummond, just add to D-R-U-M-M-O-N-D with Rich Turn Strong. I'm here to testify in support of um, SB Bill 351. I believe that's very important for um, families to be able to have contact with their inmates. Um, we have some minor children that have not been approved yet um, to see their father, and it has drastically affected um, the mental health of my children and our family remaining to be able to connect it while he's there. And I feel that it's important that all of us have that opportunity to be able to get physical contact and enjoy um, that one-on-one -on -one visit time that we can get with them until they're able to return home and the importance that it takes for their um, re-entry back into with us. Thank you. Tanya Brown, T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O. W and we support Senate Bill 351. We strongly support this bill. Um, I just want to uh, echo the previous comments that have been made and and, um, and state that you know these um, people have paid their debt to society for their crimes. They have gone on to become productive productive members of society. They shouldn't be penalized for past mistakes. And that I want you to think about this. Um, we allow um, ex-felons to be able to vote. They are able to vote. They should be able to um, come in, visit their loved ones. Again, they have paid their debts to society. They should not be penalized and let them have that interaction with their loved one. It, this would be instrumental to everyone. It benefits everyone. It benefits the the family members, their loved ones, the inmate, um, and staff. And the fact that um, being able to do that will actually um, be a win-win for everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Hi, my name is Mariana Espinosa. That's M A R I A N N E E S P I N O Z A. I strongly support SB 351. Um, I have a son who is an ex felon, and 
he is unable to go in to visit his brother who still has 21 more years to go before he's eligible for parole. He's unable to go in and visit his father who is, has life without parole. Um, and this is affecting us because my son were very close. People used to think they were twins. Where you seen one, the other was there. And now he's not able to see his brother. He talks to his brother on the phone, but that's not good enough. He's not able to hug him. He's not able to to look at him and, you know, be able to play games that they played. Um, so I strongly support this. Bill, thank you. Hello, my name is Betty Guess, B-E-T-T-Y-G-U-E-S-S, and I'm calling today in support of SB 351. I have a son incarcerated by the Nevada Department of Corrections who has been there just shy of 13 years, and we were estranged from one another for a few years before he went to prison. We finally reconciled just a couple of years ago and began communicating at first by letters only and eventually by phone calls. Just this last month in April, I was able to visit him in person for the first time. Not easy considering that I live 1,800 miles away in Indiana. I was so scared my visit would be canceled at the last minute. Thankfully, that did not happen. It had been over 15 years since we had seen one another. I cannot begin to express to you the importance of an in-person visitation and what it means for the psychological well-being and mental health of those who are able to experience it. My son later went on to tell me that he did not have words to say what it meant to be able to hug me, to hold my hand, to see the look of love for him in my eyes that he did not really believe was still there until he could actually see it. No letter, no phone call, no video visit could ever have given him that same level of assurance that he was still loved. I also cannot express to you what it means for a mother not to be able to see her child in person. It is torture, it is ongoing worry, it is constant anxiety and immeasurable frustration. It is cruel, unusual, and unnecessary punishment to deny any loved ones the privilege to visit one another in person. So I thank this committee for hearing our concerns today and I urge you to please pass SB 351. Thank you. Hi, my name is Crystal Voigt, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L, last name Voigt, V as in Victor, O-I-G-H-T. Uh, there's actually six of us here at the Grant Sawyer Building in Las Vegas. We are in the cafeteria since there was no video room for us. So um, if it's okay, we'll just give our statement and pass the phone. Uh, Th that works for us. We will in lieu of deadline day. Thank you, yes. Okay, perfect. Please. So I will keep it short in... <laughs> In lieu of deadline day, um, I did submit my statement at the last hearing, so I think there are um, a lot of us that have statements in there. Uh, my fiance is currently incarcerated in NDOC, and I am a convicted felon. I was convicted six years ago, and I completed all the terms of my probation and my requirements. I was able to work my way up from a uh, felon on house arrest just applying to a job to a senior engineer in four years. So I am very successful. I just purchased my first home. And uh, throughout the relationship with my fiance, the one thing I noticed that he never had was anybody with a strong, stable lifestyle that can show him the right way of life. And the last three years, we've been working on that. But the one thing that's holding us back is being able to visit. 15-minute um, phone calls, you can only fit so much. If we were able to visit, we can continue talking about our goals, our plans, uh, how we're going to deal with you know, um, strong or how we're going to deal with situations when they arise so that he is prepared when he comes home so that he doesn't re, um, recommit crimes and that he's able to have a successful life. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Pamela Browning, P-A-M-E-L-A-B-R-O-W-N-I-N-G. I am in full support of SB 351. Formerly, formerly incarcerated over 20 years ago, now have a loved one who has been incarcerated um, eight 
going on nine years. And because of my 20 year old criminal history, I am unable to take his four children to go visit him. Um, I fully support this bill. My name is Sonia Williams, S-O-N-Y-A-W-I-L-L-I-M-S. I am a core volunteer with Return Strong, and I also process all the visitation denial appeals. Um, <laughs> there's so there's so much there's so many of them that are due to prior felonies, 20, 15, 30, even 45 years old, um, and when I send the appeal. On behalf of them, um, my email gets blocked by wardens at facilities, so I can't get through. It's just a whole process that is just time consuming for everybody involved. Um, and we get no response. We've gotten not one single response, uh, except from one, one warden um, in northern Nevada. But anyways, I, just, we, I support the bill. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. My name is Margo Tello, M-A-R-G-O. T-H-T-E-L-L-O, and I'm a member of this community. Individuals who serve their time and complete all that was required of them should not continue to be punished. They should have the ability and opportunity to visit their loved ones. Someone who committed a crime eons ago has changed their life around, should not be prevented from seeing their child or sibling or partner. Multiple studies have shown not only that family visitations improve the lives of individuals while incarcerated, but also their time after. For example, recidivism decreases and they're likely to find an employment increases. There are so many benefits for our community by passing this bill and I ask that you support it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Adelina Gaxiola, or A-D-E-L-I-N-A, -E last name G-A-X-I-O-L-A. I am a, an ex-felon and I currently have a son that's incarcerated in the Nevada Department. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's incarcerated in the Nevada Department of Corrections. For me not to be able to see him or let him see me and him see the change and to be able to um um just to touch him and let him know that um the way of life that he was headed isn't the um isn't the right way. But um me being his mother and just I just wanna look in his eyes, I just wanna be that positive example for him because I know that I'm the only support system that he has. And um, it just hurts to know that I can't do that. He's only 23 years old, and he has this whole life ahead of him. So um, this is really a barrier for me, and I would just like to be able to um, be in support of this bill for him. Thank you for your time. Hi, I'm, I'm Nikki J, and I am in support of SB. Three five one. Um, I have a son that's incarcerated. He's he just turned twenty years old. I one that have no felony. Yes, I have been arrested, but it I have no charges against me, and I have been denied since February of last year, and still being denied up to last week. It's a hurtful feeling to know that my son is asking me, "Mom, I just want to hug you." I want to see you. And I can't. Me and my son is really, 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 really close. Very close. And just to hear him say, you know, Mom, I don't even want to talk to anybody else but you when I get a chance to call. I just call you because you're very important and he's concerned about me as well. I'm very concerned about him. He has a nephew that's turning three years old that now seems to be getting an IEP because he won't talk. He won't talk at all because he misses his uncle. He was talking when, and when his uncle was home, but when they took his uncle, he stopped talking. He stopped talking, and when he spoke to his, his uncle last month, no, it was yet yeah, last month. And when he said, okay, they hanging up the phone, I got to go. And he was telling his nephew he loved him. He screamed, no, 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 don't hang up. We didn't even know he know how to talk because he was not talking. He hasn't talked for a year and a half. So 
I am asking, please be considerate into what's taking place. All persons need, need needs to visit their loved ones, especially when they are minors. Minors need to see that, see their loved ones, touch their loved ones, talk in person, you know, have that intimate moment with their loved ones for their mental situation. My son as well has the IEP too. Ma'am, are you still there? Okay, she said thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else with you? That's it for us in Los Angeles. Okay, thank you so much. No, that's it for us. Too. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. And to those of you there at Grant Sawyer, I, I just want us to recognize the demonstration of most people would go to Grant Sawyer, find out there's not a room available, they're going to jump back in their cars, they're going to go home, they'll log in at home, they'll call from home, they'll call from back at work. And yet these women all stayed together in the cafeteria together. And I think that's the point. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller. Hello. My name is Charmaine, C H A R M A I N E Simmons, S I M M O N S. And I support SB 351. My son, my only child, has been incarcerated since 2007. He's currently in Lovelock. I've only seen him once, and that was through a special visit when he first went to High Desert. And... Um, Yes, I am a, a convicted felon, and so what? What um, my son and I we're we're close, like we're very close, like we're all we have. And just to be able to see him, to hug him, to kiss him, to spend some time with him, and communicate with him face to face is very important to us mothers. Um, so figured if I sealed my record, then I could, I would be able to see him. I spent countless time. I live in Houston, Texas. I've spent, I don't know how much money flying back and forth to Vegas, going to the law library and everything. And it took me two years. It took me two years, but I got my record sealed in Las Vegas. Even driving down to each to driving down to the police department on on MLK and going to the parole and probation, personally delivering these records um, to show them that my record is sealed. The review journal to get me out the system, and it didn't work. It didn't work. I was still denied. I can, uh, it's, it's very important. I just want to see my baby. And now I'm having lots of uh, medical issues. And I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I want to see my baby. I don't know when it's my time, but I want to see my baby. If I am granted to see my child, I will be there every chance that I can get. I will probably move back to Las Vegas. As a matter of fact, I would move back to Las Vegas for my child. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for letting us vent. Thank you so much. Welcome.
Good morning. My name is Nicole Williams. I'm an impacted family member, activist, core volunteer with, Restrong, with Return Strong. I'm calling today in firm support of SB 351. Family interaction and support is critical to the rehabilitation of incarcerated individuals and is proven to reduce the recidivism rate. The state of Nevada needs to have legislation in place so that individuals that may have made a mistake in their past are still able to visit and support their loved ones. Felony or misdemeanor charge 15 to 20 years ago should not define a person and everyone deserves the grace of a second chance. Thank you for your time and have a nice weekend. If you have recently joined and would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 351, please press star nine now. Caller with the last three digits, 770, please press star six to unmute your phone. You are unmuted and may begin. Hello, my name is Este Padgett. It's E-S-T-E-E-P-A-D-G-E-T-T. -T. I am in full support of this bill, SB 351. Thank you for hearing all the stories today. I'm so sorry that I've been so impacted by these people, these moms affected. But my family is in full support, and my fiance is incarcerated in NDOC. Thank you for your time and hearing us. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Tashika Lawson. I am testifying in support of um, Bill Number Three Five um, Three Five One. I am a person, a longtime resident of Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I have a lot of family members who are um, second generation um, people in the system. And I know that this is something that is going to cause problems for a lot of families that just want to be able to stay connected um, and being able to keep themselves tethered to the outside and to their relationships that are going to be there to help us to support them while they're inside and to actually act as a as a foundation for, for them when they get outside. So please, all we ask is that you consider that these are people's families members, these are people's children, and that, that they deserve they deserve to be able to stay connected with their families and please do not be a part of creating more oppression and systemic racism that disproportionately affects our community. Thank you. My name is Chris Cavello, K-O-V-E-L-L-O. I have a son who was recently incarcerated. Uh, during his incarceration, my husband was not able to visit our son. My husband has a federal felony. It is over 40 years old, and he has been a longtime productive citizen since then, not even a ticket. He was a longtime union member worked hard to support our family. My husband paid his dues, but my son suffered because of it. And so did the rest of our family because he was not able to visit with his father. I am in full support of this bill. It is so important for families. Thank you very much and have a good day. Melissa Duna, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-D-U-N-A. -S -S I fully support a Senate Bill AB 351. I have a son who is incarcerated. I am fortunate enough to visit my son. I have no felonies, but I can tell you as a mother, a mother's love is unconditional, and it is cruel and inhumane to have families suffer for something they did that now is over and they have paid the debt to society. I am in full support. Thank you.
There are no other callers choosing to testify in support at this time. Thank you so much. With that, I will go ahead and open it up for opposition. If there's anyone here in Carson City wishing to oppose Senate Bill 351. Not seeing any. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the line? To testify in opposition to Senate Bill 351, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you so much. Then I will open it up for neutral testimony. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in neutral? Good morning. For the record, Harold Wickham, W-I-C-K-H-A-M. Again, good morning, distinguished committee chair. Uh, first, uh, thank you so much to Senator Dallas Harris for bringing this forward. Uh, and while I am required or I am testifying in the neutral, I can tell you this administration strongly uh, supports family reunification, and we will do whatever it takes to make it happen. Um, well, Kenyatta's story, I don't know the, the details, but on face value, I can just say, Kenyatta, uh, if you will send that application in, I will expedite a response I think you'll be pleased with. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I got the nod from Senator Harris. She will make sure that Ms. Kenyatta, who I believe is still on Zoom with us, is going to do that. Um, with that, broadcasting, will you open it up for neutral testimony on the lines, please? To testify in neutral to Senate Bill 351, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you so much. Then with that, I will close testimony and welcome Senator Harris back up for any final remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Miller. I really appreciate the committee's time um, and patience with, with all of the, the testimony on this bill today. Um, I, don't, I don't know about y'all, but this is the type of stuff I came here to do. We've got a chance to um, do something not just good, but great that will significantly impact the lives of maybe not a majority of Nevadans, but will change these, however large this number is, uh, change their lives in immeasurable ways. Uh, let's get some good shit done, guys. Thank you. <laughs> okay, deadline day. <laughs> With that, I will go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 351, but Senator, I don't think you wanna go anywhere. As I said, Speaker Yeager has waived the rules and we're going to take advantage of that. And Ms. Kenyatta, we are gonna go ahead and work session this bill right now. So with that, Ms. Thornton, will you walk us through the work session for Senate Bill 351? Thank you, Chair. Senate Bill 351 revises provisions relating to communication with offenders sponsored by Senator Harris and heard just now. And there are no amendments to the measure. Members, are there any questions on the bill? Um, Assemblywoman Newby, you have a question? I was just hoping that broadcasting could put Ms. Kenyatta still, uh, or back up if she's still on the... Uh, on the Zoom? On the Zoom, thank you. I was trying to think of the word. <laughs> Hi, Ms. Kenyatta, do you understand what's happening no. right now? Hi, Ms. Kenyatta, do you understand what's happening right now? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Can you turn your um, mute? Me yeah, mute. So what's happening is we're going to work session your bill right now. That means that we're going to vote it out of committee. Out of committee. And so the next stop will and be so the floor. The next stop will be the floor for a vote from the entire assembly. So we're just not waiting to vote it out of committee this morning. We're waiting. We're voting it out right now. Okay, so with that, I will t entertain a motion to motion. do pass Senate Bill 351. I have a motion from Vice Chair Marzola <laughs> and um, a second from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. 
I'm seeing a third somewhere down there. Oh, a third from Assemblyman Gray, a fourth from Assemblywoman Considine. I think Miss Kenyatta has a vote in there. Um, so with that, um, I do have a comment on the motion and um, Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Chair. Oh, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get it together. Um, from from a mom, uh, on behalf of all you mothers, it's an honor to be able to right this wrong. And so, thank you, Chair, for work sessioning this quickly. And uh, hopefully, we can roll this out, get it over to the governor, so that we can hopefully get you moms and dads connected with your loved ones. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Members, any additional comments? Assemblyman Gray. Yeah, like this Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, similar circumstances, but not exact. I mean, my mom was never convicted of anything, but uh, she, uh, she actually went to her grave, actually, without ever getting to see my brother, um, who was doing prison time in California as well. So it uh, really does head home. Any additional comments? Okay, then with that, I will go ahead and take a vote on Senate Bill 351. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. I have to legally ask, is there anyone opposed? <laughs> okay, and with that, the motion passes unanimously. Um, I will go ahead and take the floor statement on that one. Thank you so much, and thank you, Ms. Kenyatta and uh, Senator Harris for bringing forward this measure. You're welcome. Um, and thank you members for that. I will go ahead and close. Uh, that will be it for work session right now. I also will go ahead and take public comment right now. So members, if there's anyone, um, I'm sorry, if there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to um, make public comment. Not seeing anyone broadcasting, will you open the lines for public comment, please? To provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to provide public comment, please press star nine now. Caller with the last three digits 119, please press star six to unmute your phone. You are unmuted and may begin. Hello, um, Assembly. This is Tashika Lawson. All I can say is thank you so much for passing this bill. Um, you're doing what we're sending you up there to do. So con congratulations and bravo. Thank you. Thank you. You have recently joined and would like to provide public comment. Please press star nine now. There are no other callers choosing to provide public comment at this time. Thank you so much, broadcasting. And so with that, we are going to recess to call of the chair. Um, I will tell you it will probably be, it won't be until at least mid to later afternoon. So, but with that, we are in recess. I don't have to get up already. No.